Good morning and welcome to Donor Connect. My name is Sarah Reichert. I'm the Director of Donor Relations for the Community Foundation. We bring you Donor Connects to, as a part of our mission statement, to cause, to connect donors to causes you care about. And today is a special edition because it's Giving Tuesday now. Um, we wanted to lift up the work of our nonprofit sector today with you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Deming, our board chair, to share some, uh, a quote about resilience. Dr. Deming. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my honor to serve as board chair for the Community Foundation. Um, obviously, these are um, uncertain times, um, but it's really these times of difficulty that we learn uh, the strength that we have within us. And resiliency is really just becoming aware of the strength that is deep within each of us. You know, when adversity drops out of the sky like a mountain, uh, it doesn't actually give us strength it allows us to find the strength that is always there. And the recognition of our own strength is what we define as resilience. Um, I'm looking outside my window here and there's a, a couple of uh, Canadian geese and a whole bunch of little goslings and, and green grass. And um, being aware that we have beauty all around us, even in the time of crisis is, is really important. I want to share a poem with you to get started today. This is a beautiful poem called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives might be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in the beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. So some words of wisdom from Wendell Berry to get us started on this uh, seminar about resilience. Back to you, Sarah. All right, we will start our panel discussion. Angie, welcome. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Deming, uh, for your reflection. We truly appreciate your leadership and compassion for our community, especially in times like these. I am so pleased that you all are able to join us this morning uh, for this Donor Connect session, Inspiring Resilience Across Nonprofits. This is an especially uh, timely topic, topic because as you heard, today is Giving Tuesday now uh, to encourage giving to nonprofit organizations that support individuals in our community and also contribute to this incredible quality of life that we have right here in Central Iowa. I am honored to have with me this morning three incredible colleagues who work tirelessly to support the nonprofit sector in our community. Uh, I think it is a true honor to have the opportunity to work alongside them and have been able to do so for many years. Um, I can attest personally to their commitment and advocacy for the role that nonprofits play in all aspects of life mm -hmm. here in Central Iowa. They are innovative, they are committed, they are relentless advocates for good. They are above all else collaborative and they live out this better together spirit. Since the COVID-19 challenges began impacting our community, many of us have come together to um, leverage resources that could really best help nonprofit organizations on the front line really lean in, uh, in, in courageous ways for our community. Uh, together, um, those of us that you'll hear from today have helped to do many things, um, including launching an information portal for nonprofits to provide updates to our community's 211 resource hotline. We helped develop a one-stop option for nonprofits to share challenges that they're seeing through the nonprofit updates portal. We came together uh, along with Bravo Greater Des Moines and provided an opportunity for weekly conversations within the nonprofit sector uh, with more than 200 registrants, simply providing a place for nonprofits to learn together and to support each other. Uh, we know that this is a time that can often feel beyond lonely in many ways, 
uh, and that togetherness is really important. As a group, we also heard the need and uh, created uh, a nonprofit ask line where we help organizations connect directly with an attorney uh, so that they can best leverage federal and state resources uh, to, to navigate this time and the challenges that they as an organization face. Throughout this and constant and um, conversations, webinars, research, phone calls, and text messages, we have learned a lot about the resiliency of our sector. But we've also learned a lot about the challenges that we will need to tackle as a community. I'm gonna ask Tom to, to put up this quote for me. Um, this, is, this is a quote that was shared at our last nonprofit call last week, our community circles call. Um, and it really resonated with folks on, on the call. Yes, we are all in the same storm, but we really are all in different boats. Organizations in the nonprofit sector have different resources, different funding models, different pre-existing conditions, different structural challenges, different access, different programs. But no matter what is different, we do know that all nonprofit organizations have a true love for our community and for those they serve. So with that, I would like to welcome to the screen my colleagues, uh, Suzanne Minnick, who is president of the Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, Renee Miller, who's the Chief Community Impact Officer with the United Way of Central Iowa, and Eric Burmeister, who is the Executive Director of the Polk County Housing Trust Fund. So thank you so much for joining us today and for all the ways you partner. It's so good to see you all. Thank so you. This, is, <laughs> this is gonna be difficult for those of you who know any of us. Um, not being able to play off of each other in a true in-person panel is going to be a little challenging, but we are going to do our best here this morning. Um, all of you have so many different lenses in the nonprofit community, um, and you bring those to every meeting that you attend and every conversation that we have. And I'm curious, um, throughout all of this work, and when you look through all of those lenses in, in relationship to the COVID-19 crisis, what, what themes are you seeing from our nonprofit sector during this response phase that, that we're um, experiencing in our community right now? What are the themes that are popping up for you? Um, so, you start. Oh, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. I know, this is how it works. Sorry, we'll go there. <laughs> um, go ahead, Renee. Uh, your picture's on the screen. <laughs> um, I was just going to say it's hard to pick one theme because there have been so many that have emerged. Um, but one lens that I can bring and that I think has been a valuable tool for our community is something that you mentioned earlier, Angie, you referenced um, our 211 hotline. And when I think about the themes that we see, um, we kind of have a unique position with the ability to see those emerging needs kind of rising across the community um, in a couple of different ways through our 211 call center that is hosted over at United Way. Um, 211 has really been a long-standing community resource, connecting people to services that are needed. But as probably everybody knows, we were activated to be the statewide COVID hotline. So really what that platform offers is kind of a unique perspective, both from an individual perspective, individuals that are calling in and asking questions about not only the medical needs or the medical side of COVID, but then those indirect impacts that are happening um, in terms of housing supports, um, unemployment, um, food insecurity, legal services, those are kind of some of the top tier needs that we've seen and trends that have been emerging. But the other thing that I think is really unique about this is it, it goes back to that strength of the nonprofit network that we were that you were just referencing and that as we see these needs emerge we we now more than ever need a strong nonprofit network and this gives us an opportunity to see where the greatest pressures are on our nonprofits where are the needs um, of individuals and where we can connect people but then how that increases the demand of some of our most um, important uh, nonprofit partners across the community. So I think this has really helped us 
figure out, you know, what, what not only do individuals need, but then what nonprofits are going to need to be there to respond and where any unmet needs might be where we need to strengthen our nonprofit network where we can. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. You know, our community has, um, especially the nonprofit sector, has really used opportunities to leverage data in diving deeper in programs, making pivots in programs. And, and you're right, I think we're learning a lot from the 2 on one calls because they're coming directly from the ground. Um, uh, Eric, what, what kind of uh, themes are you seeing in sort of the housing space or another work you're doing? So uh, beginning um, in, in very, er well, in early April, uh, our board decided that it was really important that we reach out individually, one-on-one, -on -one, to each of the each of the housing nonprofits that uh, we work with. And I can say absolutely consistently to to the very last one of them, their concern is for the clients that they serve. And so, as we talk to those folks about what kinds of issues they were facing, what kinds of needs they had, and, and frankly, what kind of fears they had. It was not about their own organization. Um, it was not about what this looks like when we come out uh, the other end. To the very last one of them, it was about how this was affecting the clients that they serve and the work that they do. And so if there's, ever, if there's ever been any doubt that our nonprofit sector was uh, self-serving, um, this uh, proved to me that, that that is not the case. I, I love that. I, I think that is oh, just such, such a wonderful perspective and absolutely true in the discussions we've had. I know Suzanne, you and I have talked a lot about just the true caring and concern of, um, of leaders in the sector. Um, what, what types of themes are you seeing um, right now from your vantage point? So I think I would build off of what Eric just said. Um, there's been a relentless commitment to our community as a whole and to the individuals that our nonprofits are serving. Um, but I would also say, in addition to that deep caring that we might expect, there's been um, an enhanced um, nimbleness, leverage, and innovation. So the business side of how is it we are going to deliver on our mission? What is our responsibility and how do we need to adjust? Sometimes it is their entire business model to be able to still step up, um, step aside, step beside our community members in their deepest hours of need. And so I think we've seen that across all sectors, whether it's delivering telehealth, whether it's trying to deliver our educational system, our healthcare system, across all sectors they've had to, and they have stepped into the space of innovation, nimbleness, and then leveraging the capacities and the strengths of others, right? Not staying here, but they've really, um, repeatedly I witness on a daily basis how they build off of one another and build off community as a whole and uh, it gives me great hope for what we have in front of us. Yeah I, I know I've been in several discussions some of those including you um, you as well where we've had nonprofit organizations um, you know even even see an opportunity for funding to support some work and instead they'll say, you know what, Th this organization is much better um, to deploy that resource right now. We can, we can do this piece because we have maybe this infrastructure already. Um, so I think, you know, we're seeing some really powerful ways that collaboration are showing themselves, um, even when it comes to funding. And I think that that is just such a testament to the caring and compassion that, that we have within the sector. You know, one, one of the things that, you know, I, I really think is a theme that's um, coming out of this is, is a lot of opportunity. Yes, there's certainly innovation, um, but I've been struck by the number of organizations that are also using this as a time to pause for what, what's coming next or what, what re-emerging from COVID might look like as well, um, whether it be business models or things like that. And um, I think that that's, 
you know, going to be a challenge, but it's also takes such courageous leadership to really think differently about how we support our community. And Eric, to your point, always keeping um, those that they serve at the center. Um, that has really been um, shining through in, in our sector. So I, I love that. And, and I love being able to, to see many of the things that you're referencing as well. Um, you know, so, so there are wonderful moments and we, we smile and, and we get really caught by the, the power, but we also understand that this is an incredibly trying time. Um, I think all of us have had discussions with executives or board members about all ranges of questions um, right now trying to manage from organizations that have lost multiple revenue streams to organizations that have lost nearly all employees and what that looks like. So, you know, what, what are you really seeing about the realities of this pandemic on our sector and what that means um, right now in our community? Okay, can I toss that one to maybe Suzanne first? So when I was thinking about, you posed the question about just what are we most worried about as especially in, as we move maybe into a space of recovery and um, I see wonderful Bob Riley has posted a, a great question in the comment box about um, where I'm losing sleep is um, whether as a community we will allow inequitable recovery to take place. I, I, I want for us all to look at the quote that you started this with, Angie, and to be immensely mindful that we are all in different boats. And um, will we go the extra mile to ensure that all children and families have equal opportunity to emerge? Uh, and what systemic policy decisions will we make that either foster um, equitable recovery or don't? And, and that's a question we all in the nonprofit sector, the business sector, as community members, um, we need to keep posing in front of ourselves and hold each other accountable for that. That's hard, hard, deep, deep work. And it's, uh, I hope we don't see that we have a choice in it. Thanks for that reflection. I definitely agree. It's a very tough space, but I think uh, moments like this really, you know, hold, can, can help hold our feet to the fire on something yeah. um, that, that our community maybe has been teetering on and that we can really activate uh, in addition to the equity space um, as an opportunity. I also think about how COVID-19 has, has given us this ability to activate on the telehealth, for example. I mean, this is a conversation that's been happening in our community for so long. Um, and sometimes when, it, when going gets tough, we just realize what needs to be done and we find a way to do it. Um, but the equity piece is certainly something that I, I would echo as, critical for, for how we reemerge from this. Well, and to be clear, it's not that the crisis is what's um, creating inequities. It's Correct. finding a giant light on it for us. Um, yeah. They were there before. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more um, with you uh, coming up here about the Disaster Recovery Fund, but that was a key element to how and why the Disaster Recovery Fund was established um, and how really vulnerable populations are being looked at. So absolutely, we'll, we'll share more too. Um, Renee, how about you? Um, what's your reflection on the realities happening right now within our sector? Yeah, thanks Angie and thanks Suzanne for those important comments because I really want to um, kind of expand on that a little bit and, and be thinking about Kind of that voice and the advocacy piece because we you know when we talk about the nonprofit network and the individuals that are served by it um, oftentimes nonprofits are not always at the top of the list um, when it comes to resources and support and and voice um, but they're often at the top of the list for places to turn when people need help and we talk about kind of shining the light on the inequities. I think one element that you know keeps me up at night and I've been thinking about since the beginning is really how can we harness the collective voice of our nonprofit network to ensure that 
we have a, a common platform to be able to share and, and continue to hold people's feet to the fire, as you said, that we don't lose sight of that because ultimately in the end, we're, you know, we're talking about a network that time and time again, and that you heard from Eric at the very beginning, is willing to step into the space um, where no one else is and willing to take on kind of that critical, um, really intense work. And in order for us to do that, we really need all of the voices to kind of come around that network. And really what we're seeing then is the, the end result is the impact on individuals and families in our community and oftentimes the most vulnerable. So I think about kind of our nonprofit infrastructure and our ability to sustain that in an equitable way. Um, but I also think of this as an opportunity for us to really garner and harness that collective voice and make sure that that doesn't get lost um, in the noise that's happening right now. Well said. Eric, how about you from your perspective? You're on mute. You're on, you're on mute, Eric. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all um, right. They, uh, so um, I agree. I think that the, um, for those of us that, that work in this, in this area day in and day out, sometimes it's really frustrating uh, to understand how our, um, our, our larger community and particularly the power structure of our larger community doesn't see the same things we see. Um, and doesn't really recognize both the, um, you know, the the inequities of of our of our current system, uh, nor in many cases the deep need that 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 many folks in our community have. And so, if we are able through this to uh, develop more of a collective voice uh, that's that's louder and more urgent. Uh, than what we what we are individually or what we have been in the past, then um, maybe we can begin to see some of those larger systems changes that um, uh, really can begin to to reduce the inequity, um, not only racial inequities but also economic inequities um, that are uh, um, that really impact day-to-day uh, -to -day the people that uh, the nonprofits that we fund serve. Very true. The, the other piece that I keep thinking about um, in terms of the realities of, of this current time is just how our community is going to have to face a, a conversation about how do we best serve and meet the needs and and I think there will be some some opportunities for organizations to come together alongside each other and whether that is merger alignment strategic partnerships whatever that looks like there is such a wide range of ways for organizations to work together um, i think i think those are some some conversations that are going to be um, difficult but yet i think also um, there is a desire as you said eric to keep the the service of those who need it at the forefront. And I think now is a time when we'll see some of those, those opportunities emerge. Um, and I, my hope is that it um, continues to, to best serve those that need it the most, however those partnerships are created. I think that there was some general disbelief, at least in, in our country, about the report that was released about, what, a year ago that said that uh, a, a huge majority of the households in this country could not manage a $400 emergency. Well, this is that playing out in real time. And so if there was ever any doubt that that was somehow inaccurate or was somehow um, a, a, an overstatement of the economic equity issue, um, I invite you to take a look around at uh, at what's happening right now with uh, with those households that were that that are employed by our service industries. Mm -hmm. 
there's so much work I know that United Way has helped our community understand around this, this specific population that, that's often referenced as ALICE, which is asset limited, income constrained, but employed. Um, and so what that means for our community is exactly as you said, Eric, there are folks on the ground day in and day out working jobs, multiple jobs, um, and, and we're finding sort of in this gap space many, I think Renee, you had called some of, some of them the newly needy in some of the information we're getting from 211. Yeah, it, yeah, it's such a great point. And I, I think that's a really important opportunity that we have right now um, because we have individuals who have never had to navigate really difficult systems before and have never been in situations where they've had to figure out how am I going to make a decision on do I put food on my table or pay my rent. Um, they're always kind of living on that cusp, but I think what we're seeing and I think about the voice that we have and the advocacy element of this, that my hope is that individuals who um, unfortunately are now facing some of those difficult choices and decisions will bring about a greater appreciation for the systems and the challenges that others have to face every single day. And my hope is that we can, can harness that and um, utilize that opportunity, um, in some cases tragic, but that that will grow the appreciation um, of these challenges. But yes, we, we have a lot of work to do and we need this really strong, unique, diverse nonprofit network to help us kind of emerge from this place that we're in right now. And you know, when, when you said diverse nonprofit network, you know, I think a lot of where, where our minds often go and certainly probably where many of yours on the call are going is to the individuals directly in need. Those who are calling two and one, those who are are facing, you know, sort of um, financial crises or health concerns. But you know, when we talk about the diversity of the sector, I mean, we're we're talking about all elements of the sector being impacted right now. We're talking about health and human services. We're talking about environmental organizations. We're talking about arts and culture organizations. Think think about you know all of those entities that truly provide. Um, a variety of support uh, to not only individuals, but just to the quality of life we have here. Um, you know, we have been so blessed to have such a vibrant network, um, including the arts and culture space and community. Um, and you know, when you when you can't put on shows and when you can't sell tickets and when your events and galas are canceled, it's impacting um, the bottom line of those entities. So, you know, as we emerge, both from the perspective of helping the individuals and the families, you know, we also need to be doing that, as, as Renee mentioned, understanding the whole diversity of the sector, because it will take all elements um, for, for a recovery that, that we want um, in, in our community. So, so Renee talked a little about some of the things she's hoping for. Um, let, me, let me turn it, you know, to Eric or, or Suzanne. What, what gives you hope right now um, transcending this experience of COVID-19? Go ahead, Suzanne. Ooh. The perfect pass. I was waiting for that. One, I knew one of you would do it. <laughs> Suzanne's got it. So um, I, I think I would just put an exclamation point behind the um, an even greater collective um, nonprofit voice and really taking that to the advocacy space for true uh, system and policy changes that need to occur. I've got great hope in that area. I also think there's been, I'm sure many of you have seen the YouTube um, video that's been going around called The Great Realization. If you haven't, it's a, it's a storyteller poet. Um, but I guess my hope is that um, there is a, a resounding deep appreciation for all that our nonprofit sector does, Angie, to your point, to bring us safety, health, joy, connection, anything specifically of our, our arts and culture organizations and the way in which we've been universally experiencing isolation and how reliant we need to be and then supportive of those organizations that create connections and they break down barriers of isolation. They break down barriers of, um, of judgment and disparities. And I think 
what gives me hope is um, we're, we're experiencing a pause button here to really be aware and then attentive to those things that we need um, and have relied upon and have we then supported that in an appropriate way, whether that's individual giving, government investments, private philanthropy, like um, all of us sitting on this call. Um, I, I hope that that's what um, generates a, a new level of energy and commitment. Thank you. I one of the things that uh, we found when we started uh, reaching out to to nonprofits um, was that no one um, uh, people are trying new things and different things and uh, in terms of in terms of their own internal organization but also in terms of of delivery of their services to clients and no one seems to be um, either afraid of trying new things or simply saying, okay, we're just gonna roll ourselves up in a little ball and die until we can go back to the way things were. Um, in times like this uh, is really when innovation can blossom, even if by accident. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully uh, as we, we come out the other end of this, um, there'll be some, hey, you know what, that really worked well during the crisis. Is that a better way um, to, to advance our mission or to serve the clients that, that, that we promised to serve? And so my hope is that uh, the, the system or the, um, or the nonprofit, uh, uh, nonprofit space doesn't look the way it looked before we went into this. So um, interesting to see what sort of creativity um, comes out of all of this uh, in terms of doing things uh, better than we've done it in the past. And the, the um, exclamation point on that that I would add is, and the flexibility of those who perhaps consumed some of those free services during this time looking at some of the organizations that have done that but may have to change their revenue models right i mean those, some of those things that we've been able to participate in freely um because of the circumstances may have to transition to some other sort of um you know support mechanism to keep those nonprofits um going long term so i think it will be an interesting um transition but i would i would agree with you um sometimes uh, well i will say the thing i know about this sector is that they are innovative um and i think uh that where that is incredibly powerful. It's also important, as we all know, to support their core work. Um, so hopefully all of you on the call today will find an organization that you care about, whether it be through GiveDSM, whether it be through the organizations that you consistently provide funding to, um, or something that has sparked your interest today, and, and support them, invest in what they're doing, um, for sure. Um, I, wa I wanna just end, uh, before we open up here for a couple of questions that we have, uh, just for some real high level on the disaster recovery fund. Um, we started this call talking about all the ways that we collaborate and the disaster recovery fund is absolutely one of the ways that our community has um, collaborated. Uh, after the floods, those flash floods in 2018, um, our community realized that there was an opportunity that we could explore um, a, a collective fund, one philanthropic pot of resources that could be nimble for our community, um, no matter what the disaster would be. Uh, so over a series of several months in 2019, more than 50, I think it was even close to 70 partners came together and helped create this framework for what ultimately became the Disaster Recovery Fund. And that was activated um, with COVID-19. And uh, it's really, it's intent is to provide flexible funding and leverage local, state, and federal resources. Uh, Renee, uh, Suzanne, and I have the pleasure and the distinct honor of, of serving on that grant making committee for COVID. Uh, and we've also engaged Mary Sellers. Uh, many of you might, you might know Mary. She's the former U.S. President of United Way Worldwide and also of United Way of Central Iowa. And she's facilitating that process for us. Um, to date, that grant making committee has invested $225,000 into GAP um, kinds of opportunities in our community, helping to support surges on the ground through nonprofit organizations and their response to COVID. Um, but one of the questions that I often get is, 
how are decisions being made about investments? And Renee, I'd just like you to take a couple of minutes and help paint the picture to folks about this process that happens on a weekly basis and through the weekends um, as we think about the best investments for these, these philanthropic funds. Yeah, happy to. Um, well, first I would just say, when we talk about committed people, those of us that are on this call, um, as Angie said, every every week are having conversations. I think all of us have talked about kind of the individual interviews or conversations we've been having with our nonprofit partners um, and with others across the community. And that's been one really critical element to help inform the decisions um, that we're making for the Disaster Recovery Fund. Um, and it's not the only way, but as we come together every week to kind of get a snapshot of the point in time that we're in, we're looking at um, information, of course, from those individual conversations that are happening. We're also relying on information that's coming from Polk County Emergency Management and what the status is of kind of the environment um, that we're in and any, any challenges or obstacles that they're seeing or experiencing. Um, as Angie mentioned at the very top of this, we have our, the nonprofit portal where um, all of our nonprofits across the entire sector are encouraged to submit both um, program updates, um, which helps inform this as well, because if you start to see kind of changes in program delivery, because there's an increase in demand, that helps give us good information, not only for 211, but also for the Disaster Recovery Fund. And then that challenges um, element where nonprofits can talk about what it is that they're experiencing as challenges, and of course, those that they're serving. Um, and then we have relied on the 211 data. So as Angie talked about um, how important the 211 data is, and I talked about this at the very beginning, we really have a unique opportunity because we're seeing you know, what specifically individuals are asking for and struggling with. We're able to recognize where those referrals are going. So where is that increased demand happening across our nonprofit network and service delivery system? And then we're also able to see kind of where unmet needs are. So if we are getting a lot of calls for a particular need, but we don't have a current resource in place to refer to, that's where we've been able to step in too and try to find a collaboration of partners to kind of come together. But needless to say, it's a lot of information we're looking at every single week to help us make the best, most informed decisions. Absolutely. And those are the, they're very difficult decisions, but certainly the work on the ground is really where the difficult action is happening. And, uh, you know, Suzanne, I know you and I have been in many discussions about how these funds might be able to be deployed, separate, separate small group discussions, but can you just talk a little bit about sort of how we are balancing that need between now and what's coming? Well, I think um, there's a key point that the, the fund is named a recovery fund, and it's a long-term fund. It's not meant to be dispersed all within the first week because um, what, the, what the team has tried diligently to do is to be very present in our community and honor that those needs are unfolding and uh, manifesting themselves in different ways every day. I also think it's important that our community um, know that we are tending to the most basic needs of our community members right now. So the the needs are vast across um, all neighborhoods, all sectors, right? Every single one of us is feeling this in a very deep way. But what we're primarily right now in crisis mode responding to is thinking about how do we make sure our, all of our families have and um, community members can stay safe and healthy. So, do they have a place to live that's safe? Do they have enough food to eat? Um, are they protected? Those are the basic needs that we're tending to and attempting to do that in a way that doesn't duplicate but leverages. We're, we're blessed that we have a lot happening right now in our community. Many, many, many people are stepping up 
And so our responsibility is to ensure that those things complement one another, identify gaps, um, and build a, a more collective widespread net um, to ensure um, the best recovery possible. Well, thank you so much for those reflections. And um, as you can probably tell, we could talk about this for hours and we talk about it every day for hours. Um, and we are so grateful for your time and, and joining us. Um, we'd love to, to pause and take, I know that there are several questions, so I would invite Sarah Reichert to, to join us and we have some time for, for a few of those. Absolutely, thank you all. So we did have a couple of questions around the same theme and it's how do we as donors hold nonprofits to this level of collaboration that you guys have been talking about when we aren't in the midst of the disaster itself? So I don't know if this is going to be an answer to that question, but I kind of maybe would flip it because what I've seen across, especially our funding community, is um, we've had a mirror that's been held up. And right now what we're doing is we're going aggressively to our nonprofit community, tell us what you need. Let us just stand by you because you know best. You're on the front lines. You're, you know, whatever the mission might be. And frequently as donors and funders, and I'll speak about this from Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, we've been notorious for saying, tell us exactly what you're gonna do, an exact timeline of how you're gonna do it, anticipate every roadblock that's there and every partnership is, that's there um, and lay that all out ahead of time. And the reality is for most of these big, crazy, hairy issues we have in front of us as communities, if we knew all of that ahead of time, it would have already been accomplished. So I would say our challenge is to um, put forth greater investment and trust in those organizations call the question, inspire conversation, but then let them do their work. So I don't know that that answers the question, but I, I feel like that's part of our responsibility moving forward. Does anyone I else think, want to jump in? Yeah, I think that part of it um, is from uh, uh, the, depends upon what uh, sort of sector you're in. So I can speak to the, I can speak to the housing uh, you know, the housing piece of it. I think that uh, over the course of, of the last decade, uh, the housing uh, community has become, um, uh, first of all, much broader uh, than maybe it was in the past, but also I'm hoping or believe uh, much more connected. So the, whether it's the Polk County continuum of care in the homeless space, or whether, uh, or whether it's some of the work that the trust fund uh, is doing around uh, making sure that, that gaps are filled uh, in places that are needed. Find out, I think, if you're interested in any particular uh, organization, uh, find out what collaborative uh, tables they do sit at. Um, and I think that's, uh, because there are, I, there are collaborative tables in. In, in all different sectors. And I think asking uh, any particular organization uh, where they fit into that is a, is, a perfectly, uh, is a perfectly legitimate question. And I would say any of us on the phone, or any of us on the call would be happy to help talk about some of those tables that we're aware of, whether it's, you know, continuum of care board for homelessness, the food and security work group that opportunity convenes, Task Force around mental health, um, reach out and let us know and we're happy to discuss that. Sarah, I think you got one more you wanna to talk Absolutely. to us. Absolutely, one more question and I'll combine a couple of our um, guest questions. So how are nonprofits prioritizing budget needs for survival versus status quo? And one of those specific questions is around arts and culture and what's going on with all of these events that normally fundraise that are being canceled. That's it. That's a tricky one. Um, and, and I'll be honest, one of the reasons why last week at our community circle conversations, we had um, the local CPA come in and talk with all of those nonprofit leaders about financial scenario planning. Um, so one of the things that we as, as the funding community often talk about is for a nonprofit organization, there's not admin and then there's programs. Um, programs take people. 
And so for many of them, um, sometimes it's the funders themselves that drive organizations to think about them separately, including historical philanthropy. Um, and so one of the things that we're really encouraging nonprofits to consider is this idea of help understand really what those costs are and do some cash flow projections. Um, so we gave them some tools just last week to, to help work on that because everyone, again, is at different places with different resources. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that, but it's a tricky space um, and we're trying to, to bring in as much as we can right now as we're all kind of navigating this really uncertain terrain. The only thing I would say is I, I think that some of our organizations just, they deserve a period of grace right now. That for those who have been able to shift and pivot to continue to deliver at some level on their mission, they're doing it. Some, the pandemic is racking them and there's, there's very little they can do right now besides hold on and hope they can be there tomorrow to then step forward. So I think every organization is gonna be different and the way in which they're navigating this treacherous and daily evolving um, path, um, grace is gonna be important. And I'll toss it back to the audience. If you're a board member of one of these nonprofits and you are a business person, your, um, your expertise is needed now more than ever. And so if, um, if you are serving or interested in a nonprofit, and worried or concerned or have the ability to help them navigate uh, this particular crisis from a, uh, from a business decision standpoint, step up and volunteer. Because in many cases, uh, you're gonna be finding executive directors who are spending their day worried about serving clients and as a board member, you can be concerned, I think, or should be concerned about financial sustainability. I um, greatly appreciate, again, everyone for joining in today and to um, my wonderful colleagues. Um, I hope that all of you on the call have gotten a glimpse into the true um, compassionate advocates that they are for the sector. Um, and we, we know that we are just one piece of what um, helps make the organizations do their work. It's really those folks on the ground that are making the, the mission come into action. So we're so grateful to be able to help support that work. Um, and we especially wanna thank all of you uh, for joining us today on uh, this Giving Tuesday. Please consider um, how you can help uh, best support the nonprofits you care about, whether it's through the Disaster Recovery Fund that we mentioned today, or by seeing one of the needs posted by nonprofits on our Give DSN platform, um, or simply to the organization that holds a, a special place in your heart. Uh, we truly are a vibrant community, and that is thanks to the nonprofit organizations from all aspects of the nonprofit sector that put their mission into action every day. So help us celebrate them, help us thank them for the role that they play, and we'll continue to play in Greater Des Moines by considering um, giving a gift on this Giving Tuesday. So with that, um, thanks again to my panelists. Thanks again to all of you. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on another Donor Connect event. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.